Hello. In this video, I'd like to introduce you to the Music Thing Turing Machine, a random looping sequencer for Eurorack systems, plus its various expanders and family friends. Thanks, thonk.co.uk, for commissioning this demonstration. Chapter 1. What is Turing Machine? And why it useful? So the Turing machine is a Eurorack module that creates random fluctuating voltages, but has this magic trick that it can lock and loop those fluctuating voltages. And in so doing, the Turing machine becomes like a step sequencer, but where you don't control what every step is going to be, you let chance determine what the step will be, and then you lock it, and then you can unlock it. The way that you make it work is that you have to feed it a clock. So if I take the clock output here of the starter module and feed it in, then activity starts to happen because it's doing its during -y thing. And if I take the output and feed it in through this Mordax data, then we can see stair step voltages start to appear. Allow me to fade up the ARP 2600 that I have next to me. <laughs> Random voltages. Very squiggly. But here's the magic trick. The Turing machine allows you to lock a moment. And the length of the sequence that it locks is determined by this length knob. I have it set to eight steps and I can change that. Let's say 16. And then I can unlock. Now, you're not hearing something that's quantized in pitch. That is to say, it's not absolutely on the musical scale. You can utterly add quantizers after the Turing machine in order to quantize it, but it's not quantized by itself. And as I say, you can't determine the exact steps that you hear. You just lock when you like what you hear. There is one thing you can do, which is adjust the scale knob here. And the scale knob controls the scaling. It's an output attenuator. And so I can change the overall height. I can compress the sequence or make it higher. So if I turn this up. You see we get a very high sequence on here. We get a very up and down sequence coming out of it. If I can turn that down. And it's just like constraining the keys on the keyboard that you play. With full scale, you're playing the whole width of the keyboard within a certain voltage range. And if you turn down the scale, you're playing just a narrow amount of keys, which if you're using this to create melodic sequences, just makes the whole thing a lot more coherent. And the way it works in practice is that you're just fishing for melodies. You're fishing for ideas. You unlock. listen and then just loop and a real tenet of techno is the idea that randomness looped becomes not random anymore so it's a real exercise in relinquishing control having the ability to steer the ship but yeah giving up a certain degree of control to the id of the cheering machine but it is a steerable ship and to that end there's a very clever thing because this is a lot like a tap and on a tap it's not just on or off to let water come out you can have a tap open just a little bit and in the same way you can turn this dial so that there is a little bit of randomness getting fed into your loop again we do this by turning the dial a bit more northwards when the dial is pointing straight up then you're hearing a completely random thing. But by having the dial partially up, you can introduce randomness without losing your existing sequence completely. So I'm gonna find the point. There you go. 
Now as mentioned, there was this length dial and if I turn this down, you get satisfyingly shorter sequences. Now, there are other things, of course, the Turing machine can do. And one is the direction in which we lock. If I'm locking to the right, then I'm locking a sequence that is the length determined by the length knob. If I lock in the opposite direction, anti-clockwise, you end up with a sequence that is twice as long. because it creates an inverted version and concatenates, adds it on. All you need to know is if you go left, you get something that's twice as long as if you go right. And again, we can sew in randomness. You might be wondering about these lights that you may be able to see moving along the top. And in short, the way that the Turing machine works is that it has a thing called a shift register. And a shift register is just like a little sort of um, a line. It's like a conveyor belt that a little bit of information gets inserted. And that little bit gets passed along this little chain until it emerges at the end. The Turing machine uses randomness to sew the bits that move across, but you're creating this kind of loop of bits. And what it does is whenever it introduces a bit, it adds up all of the bits that are in the little line and that creates a number and that number corresponds to a voltage. And so the voltage you hear, the height of the voltage, how high it is or low it is, is determined by how many of these lights are lit at any one time. Now, this is important because we can influence what is lit and what isn't. And we can do this with the right switch. If you push the right switch up, it will write a positive bit. And if you push the right switch down, it will sew a negative bit. And in so doing, we can actually, to some degree, steer the sequence even more. To show you this, let me lock it in the opposite direction. So we have a new locked sequence. And if I go up, it sews positive bits and you get a higher sequence. And if I dip dab down, we sew nothingness and it becomes lower. If I click it right at the bottom, complete nothingness, no voltage. All the way up, complete height, all voltage. Do you see? And if I dib dab dib dab dib, you know, sort of somewhere in between, you can get just the right amount of bits to get the interesting sequence that you wish to have. So whilst I can't tell it what steps to be, I can influence it by locking it and then flicking the right switch up and down in order to sew a certain amount of little bits and in so doing create a certain sequence. Now, there is more it does, which is that you've got this little pulses output. And so obviously we talked about these bits, these little ones and zeros that are moving across and the Turing machine makes that available here. What you see here, this first little pulse of light gets copied to this output and becomes a gate that we can use to trigger things. This is where the Turing machine starts to become a complete sequencer. So if I take that and feed it into my ARP 2600's gate input, here we go. So now the Turing machine's pulse output is triggering the ARP and the pitch is being controlled by the output here. Let's dib dab the right switch. Oh yeah. <laughs> The Turing machine really excels. It's a sequencer that you can steer, as we're starting to see, but so often it has such good little ideas all of its own. Maybe that's just because anything looped becomes musical to a degree. I don't know. Nice. 
So it creates gates. It creates looping sequences. We lock it by turning it to the right. We lock it to the left and we get twice as long a sequence. We can determine the length with the length dial. We can determine the overall height of the voltage with the scale dial. We can flick the right switch up and down in order to influence the sequence. And we've got this pulses output. Now there are two of the sockets. CV is a CV control for the locking. We can use this to CV lock, which is very cool because for example, if you had a second Turing machine, you could use it to control the locking of the other one absolutely awesome and there is also a noise output because the machine is using randomness to sew the ones and zeros that are running through the shift register there is some random noise in there and that is available here you can tap the output and use it for noise and in the spirit of uh, sharing let's hear it But since I'm squiggling an ARP 2600 by hand, let's use the Turing machine's output and squiggle it with that. So the Turing machine is for pitch and it's also for modulation. It's a whole generative thing in just one module. Addendum. There's one more thing I'd like to show you before we move on, which is a sort of practical example of how I use Turing machines. That is to say, one of my favorite applications of them. And it's two things. It's the Turing machine as the pitch sequencer and it's a Turing machine as a modulation sequencer. And if I turn up this, kick this is the proc kick here proc bd Oof. <laughs> and then we turn up the swarm like this so now the silver one controls the filter the black one controls the pitch the pulses output of the black turing machine is gating the module and then unlock the pitch. Her. so we can control how much it is modulating. Off. Unlock. Chapter 2. Who made Turing Machine and why? So the weird thing is, you made it. Well, you might. Because I should mention that the Turing Machine is a DIY project. Now, don't panic, because <laughs> soldering in DIY is a pleasure now, not like in my day. Back in my day, you had to hang around the back of a forum and message a fella to get a hold of a PCB and beg for a panel and paint it yourself. But nowadays, you just click a button and everything that you need to mech it turns up in one beautifully constructed package. See, this video is published on June the 2nd, 2022. 
10 years to the day since Tom Whitwell, a journalist, published plans to make a module on Mod Wiggler that he called the Random Looping Sequencer. And a whole lot of people did, including myself. This is my Turing machine that I made back in 2012, using parts from that very, very first run and build. And back then, you had to buy all the bits yourself, and it wasn't terribly friendly as a whole process, and getting all the bits separately was a bit of a pain. And the modern process of making a Turing machine is so vastly, vastly easier, which is to say that the contents of these little baggies are all so well named and organised. You have numbers of things on the packaging so that you know there are five 100Ks and one 5.1K, making it very easy to find what the odd one out and locate parts without needing to know what they are. And I really want to stress that you can build a Turing machine without needing to understand electronics or understand what all these things are because everything is really well laid out and organized for you everything is bagged and labeled you can't really get lost and there's very clear instructions to help guide you through every single step of the process as such i want to stress that i do not understand electronics yet i am able to build turing machines all by myself Soldering is a very, very simple process. It's a simple knack. And I've actually made a video about soldering, in fact, which features another music thing module called the Radio Music. And I'll link to that below. It's on Future Music's channel and it talks a bit about a way into soldering that if you're not familiar with it or if you're a bit scared of it, I hope will reassure you. I have shaky hands and I don't understand electronics, but I can build Turing machines. And that means you can too. Don't be afraid of DIY, because if it means that you can have these things, it's worth it. And so before we go any further, I just want to talk a bit about the why the Turing machine, I think, is a worthwhile thing to take the time to build, especially if you're new to DIY. And Tom Whitwell made the Turing machine because he thought it was nonsensical that he was using traditional step sequences and kind of randomly squiggling the dials to try and feel out a melody that he liked. And in a sense, he thought, why bother? Shouldn't I give up some control? to the machine, let the machine suggest things and let me steer the machine. And that's what the Turing machine exemplifies. Because I've used Turing machines a great deal in this 10 years. I've come to discover that they're one of my favorite modules in all of Eurorack, and especially for the process of playing live. When I play live and I'm trying to invent music on the fly, I really am seat of the pants in front of an audience trying to invent something that happens. I can tell you that the amount of interaction points that you have by trying to readjust even just eight steps on a step sequencer, that is eight actions that have to be individually done in order to change the sequence completely. Whereas on a Turing machine, it's just two. Unlock, 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 unlock. That really is easy to do live. I find that this sequence is more practical for the process of playing live. And if you wish to, you can constrain it with quantize scales through quantizers to further make it melodic. What I love is the idea that if you're feeling creatively down, you can just unlock and listen and let the module suggest ideas and then you lock and you get to keep what you think is worth hearing. Electronic music replaces physical skill, the dexterity of playing an instrument with your taste. Because whilst two people can have a cheering machine, no two people choose to lock the exact same thing. Food for thought. Now, chapter three, Turing machine expanders, voltages and volts. So there are two different official expanders for the Turing machine. One set that controls voltages and the other set that controls gates and pulses. And so volts and voltages are expanders that add extra CV outs. And earlier in the video, we learned that the Turing machine has little bits of information that are flipping through its shift register and it adds together those bits to create an output voltage. Now, what the volts and voltages expanders do are allow you to determine 
the weighting of the bits, which is to say they allow you to create more voltages from one Turing machine, but where you can steer the voltages even more by turning the little dials. Because what you are doing is choosing how much any one bit will influence the output voltage. Now on the back of a Turing machine, you can see there is a gates and a pulses header. And we can see here on volts, there's a little word that says gates here, saying I want to be connected to the gates header. And you've got to make sure you get the red stripe the correct way, a bit like a power unit. But these expanders don't require an independent power plug, which is nice. There's still just one power plug. And by the way, if I had more volts, I could add them and chain them together and get even more voltages, but I'm going to use volts and voltages. So I'll connect this, et voila. By the way, both of these are also DIY builds and expanded Turing machine. So now we have a bunch more outputs. In fact, we have four voltage outputs. And so if you have the gift of sight, you will see little dots moving. And the dots moving along here on the Turing machine correspond to the dots descending on voltages. Now, volts uses the sort of gate outputs here in a slightly different way. But for all intents and purposes, know that it's running gates through here and what happens here is that the settings of the faders or the settings of the knobs determine how high or not the voltage is. You're effectively getting control of the influence of each of these little dots. So let's get it hooked up to the 2600. <laughs> so in so doing, I can just trim and adjust and change the sequence. It's a far more steerable output. And so we've got this little dial here. You might think that this is a scale knob, like on the main Turing machine, but it's actually not. It's an offset. And what it's going to do is shift the whole sequence up and down in the scale range, but not change the width or the height of that sequence. It's going to shift it up and down. So it's a very fundamentally different thing. Now, there's another output, and curiously, you may see that the output is written upside down, and that's because this output is an inversion of that output, and this is also an offset knob. So we get an inverted version, which is literally the upside down version of what comes out of this. But they can work to create a completely different sequence using the same data. And perhaps I might like to use both of them simultaneously. Maybe I'll use one to affect one oscillator whilst using the inversion to affect the other oscillator. If I tune them together, I might be able to get something that's nice. We'll try. Oh yeah. So one oscillator is being driven by the positive, the other is being driven by a negative. So then have this clock output which just copies the uh, trigger source and if I feed it we get a nice steady 16th almost in tune we're doing this without the benefit of quantizers so it's kind of free free form but you could quantize these outputs of course you need two quantizers or you need an ornament of crime or something like that, which interestingly has a derivative of the Turing machine inside it. Now, here's a really cool thing. Why 
just did was ensure that there was just one single bit of information moving through the sequence. And when you use the voltages expander, what happens is amazingly, you get an absolutely one-to-one -one straightforward step sequencer where you do determine the steps that every step is doing. So we get an absolutely traditional sequencer. I determine exactly what the voltages are. It's predictable every single time it will be the same ace and we can shift using the offset. All well and good. But what if you have more than one bit? Okay, so then this really cool thing happens, which is what happens is you get this very strange thing where Potentially one fader will influence the entire sequence in a way that is quite weird to get your head round, but it's actually the way that a clay sequencer works. K-L-E-E, -E, clay, which is a DIY project, DIY sequencer. The idea of the clay sequencer is that instead of having a single playhead moving through a step sequencer, you have multiple playheads, and it adds together the voltages of wherever those two playheads are. Here we can have many more than two, but the idea is still the same. It's adding together the voltages of wherever there are lit knobs, faders. And so just by adjusting one knob, you get a completely different sequence. Nice. Vaults. Vaults is a simplified version of this in a tiny 4 HP package. And we could use vaults to, say, modulate the filter. That's what we should do. Modulate the filter. The filter starts to jump up and down depending on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's nice to heavily modulate your things with a cheering machine and friends. But the whole thing is because this is being controlled by the Turing machine as the master head, if you unlock, then the whole thing, the voltages and the voltages will change too. <laughs> yes. So, volts and voltages expand your Turing machine's outputs. You can have multiple versions of them chained together. They all chain. And then the beauty is because it's all controlled by the Turing machine as its sort of master head, then by unlocking and locking the Turing machine, you can unlock and lock all of the sort of sister daughter modules that are connected to it. So it all just becomes this one wonderfully modulated whole. <laughs> Chapter 4, Pulses. <laughs>
So the pulse is, is really rather simple compared to the voltages. All it is, is it's harnessing the little row of little dots that run through its shift register and it's making them available to become drum gates, as it were. So what I'll do is I'll turn this off. Let's actually get this hooked up and then I'll show you. Just as before we connect it to the back of the master Turing machine, and if we look at the pulses output here, that's the one we want to use. We connect it, and again, there's no extra power header, it's just literally this. Now, one thing to say about the pulses, by the way, is that it does use surface mounts. So it uses little surface mount resistors that you solder in, but um, I would urge you to equally not be afraid of surface mount um, soldering, because it's actually really easy. You just need some tweezers and a tiny little bit of technique, which is to say that you put a little blob on one of the pads, on each of the pads, you pre-blob them, and then you just heat that up, and then you just put the component on with some tweezers and it will stay in place and then you just solder blob the other side. Really, really easy. And in fact, actually, when you get the hang of surface mount soldering, it is way quicker and way easier than through hole. Squid is going to help us here because the squid sample is a drum module and I want something to trigger with all of these wonderful gates. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a party. Hey, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Let's now feed the clock into the module again. And looky, looky here. Now we start to see that these lights light up. And what's happening is that, again, the shift register that is running along here, it just runs down here. Some of these are like mathematical divisions. One plus two. When one and two are high, then you get an output here. When two and four are high, then you get an output here. When four and seven are out high, you get this. And when one and two and four and seven are high, then you get one here. So these are less frequent. So again, it all just becomes one naturalistic whole. And then all we have to do is connect things. And I'll connect the one plus two to the one. It's a kick drum. And then let's say this four and seven, let's connect it to what will probably be a snare. Quite regular, maybe the one and two and the four and seven. And then let's have these quite regular outputs connected to the more incidental percussion. driving the pitch, it's also modulating my filter, and it'll do so more if I turn these up a little bit, and the pulse's output is driving my drums on the squid sample, and just as before, if I was to unlock, then everything's going to change. We've got a double 16, 32 step sequence. Unlock. Yeah. Let's use these outputs and see the modulate the, the vault per octave. Chapter 
to five. Factral Mix. So the final expander is called Factral Mix, and it is a Vactrol powered <laughs> mixer, which combines with the Turing machine's kind of gates header, and in short, it's a it's a kind of mixer that is animated. And it's animated by the pulses that the Turing machine makes. And it mixes together four different signals, that is audio signals, although it can mix together DC um, voltages. And it outputs them in stereo. Now, it has multed stereo outputs because Tom Whitwell says, he says, try running it and creating feedback loops, running reverbs and filters and running it back into itself to create kind of interesting tones, percussion and other sort of weirdness. And in this example here, I've got uh, more music thing modules that will be radio music and chord organ. And I've also got the direct oscillator from the 2600 and a feedback loop running through the 2600 coming in. So we have four inputs and we have a stereo output. And um, yeah, you can just kind of hear what it does. But you couldn't make real music out of it. And of course, you all know what real music is. I was just about to ask that. Anybody know what real music is? Well, uh, people in the 19, you know, people in the music business, what real music was real music, was music that made real money. So. Uh, Carpenter's record made money, and then people understood, yeah, you can really use these things to, you know, to, to, uh, to produce, to play, to apply, uh, whatever word you want to use. Music, that was important because it was not, because it was the first but because people really wanted to listen to it, it satisfied some, you know, it was the music and the people to people. Sean Bach is still being sold today. It was just a classical record for a long period there. Uh, and after that, thousands of musicians around the world understood, yes, this thing. So then by locking and unlocking the Turing machine, you kind of get different patterns from it. Make my music out of it. How quickly did the word spread? Uh, well, uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer began touring, or pretty fast, but still, uh, the music was what come by, they look at it with, you know, this long face. They look at it and say, what's that? <laughs> Synthesizer. What's it do? <laughs> well, then you should call this knob, you know. That knob there, this knob, you know. You might through a little. And then, uh, you know, usually they said something. Yeah, you expect me to sell that in my store? You expect me just to understand that? And they move away. Panel there. Well, probably before we. Do, I mean, when you look at, if we go back to the art, yeah, and look at the art or, <laughs> the, or, the man, yeah. or this thing here, um, something reminds you it was supposed to sound so hi-fi and so future with really retro woods, earthy. Uh, I don't know idea of how it was supposed to sound. It was to keep things as general as possible. It's not designed to be specific sort, any specific sort of sound. Uh... Nice. Chapter 6. Turing Machine Friends. A very important final fact about the Turing machine is that it is open source. 
that means that you can build your own Turing machines by downloading plans, parts, having PCBs made and all of the other bits and bobs and build one yourself. And of course, it also means that people can iterate on the Turing machine design within certain parameters. And so we have other things in the Eurorack world that are inspired by the Turing machine and that you can get. And also things outside of the Eurorack world. So namely, things like mystic circuits, vert and leaves, grayscale modulars, permutation module, uh, magpie modulars, crazy combo panels, which combine Turing machine and the expanders into single modules. And then also things like the ornament and crime, which is a multifunction module that has kind of Turing machine inspired blocks inside of it. You have the frames, parasites, firmware, and indeed mutable instruments. Marbles is really a kind of super Turing machine with many different spins on it. But then in the software realm, reactor blocks and especially VCV Rack and also Ableton's Max for Live all contain Turing machine style things. So if you fancy a little Turing machine, there are lots of different ways to get it. And I think due to its open and sort of generally friendly manner, there are also some hardware things that are designed to work with it. And I have a couple of them here, just as an example. One is the wrong TMLPG, which is a version of the Vactrol Mix Expander, but that allows you to have variations. You can change how the little uh, inputs are pinged using logic internally. By flipping these switches, we have eight different combinations and we can get different patterns, but the principle is much the same. If I turn this up. We have a number of elements coming into the four inputs here. Yeah. And as I say, we can flick these switches and change the pattern. We can also unlock. down to make that sparse. Nice. Volume controls here. However, there is another cool thing it can do. What I'm doing at the moment is I'm clocking it with the Schreibs Machine Modular Pulsate, which is a module that creates eight um, square waves. And it has PWM, it has rate controls. And so it's a module that's designed to be a kind of um, drone machine source, as it were. And I'm clocking it with one of the square waves, but we've got PWM and listen to what happens. If we widen the square, it creates a longer gate, which is dead nice. that's clocking it too so it changes the rate but it's just a nice thing to interact with for your plucky plucks or your long droney moments nice that's great I'm showing the Pulsate because it's obviously an excellent clock source and a drone source, which is useful as a source for your TMLPG. But the Pulsate has a secret, which is that the Pulsate is actually a cheering machine sort of master clock. The folks behind Shrive's machine made it so that the Pulsate can act as a a sort of master Turing machine. And so actually what you can do is you can connect things like the TMLPG, you can also connect the pulses and the voltages expanders. And in so doing, using the Pulsate as the kind of master source, completely independent of a Turing machine, or of course, alongside one in a case, it's all just one big happy family. And especially if you love making drones or kind of unsynced freeform music. So, from 2012 to 2022, 
The music thing Turing machine is a source of modulation. It can loop and it can be steered, but you can't tell it exactly what to do. It's a companion, something for modulating timbres and also making melodies. I've used it extensively, and although I apologise for using the F word, I would probably say it is truly one of my favourite modules in all of Euro Rack. So if you don't have a Turing machine, it is a very good reason to try DIY to get one. Or indeed, there is a world of software and there are a world of kind of third party Turing machine style things that you can investigate. If you'd like to buy a Turing machine kit, the website is thonk.co.uk. Links below to all of the things that we discussed in this video. Subscribe if you do not subscribe already. I also have a link to my Patreon. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time.